John the 11th chapter, beginning in the first verse. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore her sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after that, after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, in the day he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go to make a way, I go that I may wake him again. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death because they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort, to comfort them concerning their brother. And then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was still sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And, who, who, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the, who has come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. And then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then, when Mary came where the Jews, where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? 
And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he's been, been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do for this man works many signs? If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he said, this he did not saying on his own authority, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they saw Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? How both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. To set the stage briefly, remember we said the last two chapters combined with this chapter had the same theme. Chapter 11 concludes a very specific series of vignettes from 33 years of Jesus' life. Chapter 12 until very near the end of the book of John rolls fast forward the 24 or 48 hours before Jesus' death and his resurrection. In chapter 10, Jesus is involved in what terminates in chapter 11 with seven miracles that are selected from a great many miracles. John tells us that if all the miracles done by Jesus were recorded in books, that the world would not be able to contain all the books. 
There are many who scoff at the idea of miracles. The way liberal theologians address them is to attack the authenticity of the scripture in places where miracles are presented, saying that these were simply folk tales that had been added over the, over the years and that in reality, they never occurred. There are serious difficulties with that particular reasoning because we find these recorded in the most ancient documents. If they had been alive, somebody would have spoken up at that time because there were enough of his detractors that they would never have gone without challenging what was clearly a lie. Others today point to the book of John and say it is absolutely clear that the reason that Jesus did miracles was not because he was setting a preference for the Messiah in future ages to do miracles in the lives of people because John says plainly that the miracles he presented were specifically for the purpose of validating that Jesus was the Messiah. They were proofs. However, that discounts the fact that John says that Jesus did so many miracles that books recording them could not be contained in the world. But in these seven specific cases, they were designed to validate the fact that he was God come in the flesh, the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who was equal with God in eight of his I am statements. I am as God spoke to Moses in the burning bush and said, I am that I am. All the other miracles were miracles done in the aiding of human beings for other reasons. The bottom line, God does miracles and he does them today and he does them according to his will. And pure Christians may believe that in the ultimate wisdom of God that he is perfectly capable of doing miracles in the lives of believers today. Jesus, in his last I am statement, answers the doctors of the law, not common people, the rulers of the Jews, members of the Sanhedrin. When they asked him point blank, if you're the Messiah, say so. Their concept of the Messiah was that this would be a man, a human being, not God, who would be sent as Moses was sent with the specific power, sanction of God and message that would force the Romans out, restore Israel as the preeminent nation and bring Judaism to the forefront of all religious thought in the world. They got it wrong. They didn't understand it. And when they point blank, they asked Jesus if he was the Christ. He said, yeah, I'm him. The I am statement. But then he goes a step further. And he says, and not only that, I'm the son of God. And my father and I are one. In other words, I am equal with God. And it infuriated. They considered it blasphemy. And at the end of the 10th chapter, they took up stones and they would have killed him except by the power of Almighty God, he walked right through the crowd. And they could do nothing. There's a reason. It wasn't time yet. And that method of execution was not prophesied by the prophets. Now, 
understanding that there are 12 disciples. Most of the 120 have taken off. They didn't figure they could live by what Jesus said. For whatever reasons of their own, they abandoned him. And the 12 look at each other when they saw that they took up stones to kill Jesus and the thought had to go across their mind. And when they finish with him, they're coming for us. They are not going to leave us alone and just leave him as if everything is going to go away. They know us. They've seen us. They saw us on the hills when we fed the 5,000 with Jesus. They saw us when we stood by him, when the lame man was healed. They saw us when the blind man got up and washed in the pool of Siloam. We were all there. They all know who we are. And they threatened to kill him. And he's wisely stayed out of Judea, stayed out of Jerusalem the entire time. Now, a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. It's a little tough to keep track of the Marys in the Bible. There were five. And it's difficult to know which one they're talking about. John here makes it clear so everybody understands which Mary he's talking about. Because remember, He's writing this as the last gospel. All the rest have been written. All of them have been circulated throughout the churches. Everybody knows what they've said. And they know about the, about the Marys. So he clears it up. And therefore the sister sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. The word love there, phileo. He's saying... This is your bud. This is the guy who has relationship with you. This is the guy that you laughed with and you cried with. This is the guy whose heart is for you. This is the guy who is one of your closest friends. And this is the guy that you've cared for, you have affection for. He's sick. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever had a situation or somebody you really had a relationship, be it family member or friend, and you got the phone call that said, Bill's had a heart attack, and, he, and he's headed into surgery. They say they're gonna have to do a quadruple bypass. You call your boss and you say, I know this is inconvenient, but I have to go. And you get in your car, and no matter how broke you are, you find the gas money so that you can be at that hospital and in that waiting room with Bill's family. That's what the, the response that they expect because of the fact that Jesus and Lazarus have a relationship. And when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Bob's had that heart attack so that God can have glory. I'll bet you that lost a few of them. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Not the same word that's used for love. This is agapeo. Agapeo means to care about somebody so deeply that you seek for their best benefit. You're going to do what's right for them, no matter how they respond, no matter how anybody else feels, no matter what anybody else thinks. When the scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the word is agapeo. In other words, no matter what it costs, no matter how it hurts, no matter what people think, there is one chance for rescue for those that I love, and I'm going to take it no matter who understands and who doesn't. So Jesus was seeking the best interest of Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that, that he was sick, 
he stayed two more days in the place where he was. He doesn't jump in the car. He doesn't max out his debit card on the ATM machine. He doesn't do any of those things. The agapeo overrode the phileo, the feelings of relationship and this love for his friend was overridden by doing what was in the best benefit of these people. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. And are you going there again? And the thing that they don't say, that's the white elephant, the 8,000 pound gorilla in the room is, and when they finish with you, they're gonna take us. And you're really, really? You're going to go two miles from Jerusalem where they tried to kill you before? And Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. Now, the first time I read this many years ago as a new Christian, the only question in my mind was, What the heck is he saying? What does that mean in the midst of all this? Here's what it is. Jesus had told him that he was the light of the world. Jesus walked right between those who were going to stone him and walked out and they couldn't find him. There was a timing to everything that was happening and he looks at them now and says, the light of the world is within you and despite your fear that they'll take me and then they're going to take you, if you make the decision to follow me and to do what I've asked you to do, nobody is going to do anything to you until I say so. And if I do say so, it's an act of agapeo, and you will be glad for eternity that you did. There are so many Christians that could forego so much grief in their life if they realize that the trouble they're going through, the difficulties they see, the paths that God has asked them to walk, all of it, all of it is under his watchful eye and when we follow after what he says is within his will and I don't care how dangerous, difficult, expensive, troublesome, that path seems to be. Nothing's going to happen to you without the permission of Almighty God. And so you stand up, you square your shoulders, you buck up, and you walk the path he set before you. And you do it knowing that you are firmly in the hand of God. This last week, I had a unique experience. The physical director, the uh, rehab director that works for me, a therapist, came to me knowing that I'm a believer. We've had conversations before, and she's a believer also. She stayed after a staff meeting of department heads, and she said, I need to talk to you about a patient. This is a man who has stopped eating. He is in his room and he's demanded that the nurses close all of his blinds, close his privacy curtains, turn the lights off and let me, for them to remain blank, but dark. He refuses to participate in therapy and he's lying in the bed and he tells people that he has lost everything and he's just waiting. She sat down, and for the second time since I've been there, kind of taking a risk, risk as the chief executive officer, I invited her to pray with me for this man. And we prayed for him, and she broke down in tears. I about did too. 
because I've seen the situation before when God is setting up a divine appointment. I knew in my heart God was going to do something. So I agreed to go see the man because of my background and education as a therapist. And I went in, and sure enough, everything was the way I'd been told. And one of the things we prayed for that I asked her is if the man had any, any religious background at all of any kind. And she said she didn't know. And then I felt led to say, I don't know what people do in their trouble when they don't have Jesus, when they have no hope, no light at the end of the tunnel. Went into the room. I asked him if, I'm, if he minded if I sat down, introduced myself. The man responded without hesitation to every question I asked. I asked him to tell me about himself. He said that he was one of the general contractors that built the Space Needle. That he and his wife of over 50 years had finally parted. She had died. He went on to tell me that his father had been a pastor and that he was a graduate of their denominational Bible school. And then he said, I've lost everything I have and I just can't believe anymore. My first thought was to go and get my Bible and come back and to begin to tick off the promises of God. And the Lord <coughs> spoke to my heart and just and said, tell him the greatest truth you know. You're telling people this all the time. I think sometimes people think I, it's just a saying I say. So I did. I told him that everybody has a crisis of faith from time to time. But there's a reality. It's not easy to walk away from Jesus. I told him, you don't hold him. He holds you. We talked a little more and I did share scripture with him. When I started to leave, I was walking over to ask the man if he minded if I prayed with him. And for the first time, he looked away from the pillow and looked at me and said, would you pray for me? I prayed for the man. And then I left the room, intending to go back on a daily basis to encourage his faith. I didn't get that chance. The next morning, the man was fully dressed walking with a physical therapist, laughing, and telling those people about his life. I felt kind of like a fraud because I was getting all kinds of kudos from the nursing staff and whatnot, and I was having to tell them this had nothing to do with me. And it opened the door for me to have a witness with others that I never would have had. There was a miracle that happened in that room. A man who had been so beaten down by the fact that many things had occurred in his life that made him question and wonder whether or not God would still do a miracle for him or not. What are the promises that he felt he had from God as a younger person would ever come to pass? <coughs> the man who saw the things that he valued and loved, gifts from God in his wife, all fading away. The problem was he had lost sight of the faithfulness of God. 
and he had lost sight of the fact that nothing could take him out of the hand of Jesus. Nothing. And that the progression of all things in his life are on a timeline. And as he walked in the daylight, there are 12 hours in a day, and nothing is going to make that day any longer or any shorter. The days of our lives, the number of steps we take, the number of beats that our heart will take in our lifetime are all numbered and ordered of God before we take our first breath. We walk safely in the hand of God. And you can live in fear and not believe it, or you can live in faith that that's true. Just as Jesus is saying to the disciples, with that understanding, listen to what he says to them again when they're essentially saying, you're going to take us to Jerusalem, they're going to kill you and then kill us. And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? There's a plan here, guys. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. If Jesus has said, go, go. Don't worry about what it costs. Don't worry about what the circumstances are. Have faith that he'll see you through. And whatever happens in that, <coughs> you're in the hand of God. These things he said, and after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might wake him up. And then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. They clearly thought, you know, it's a good sign when the fever breaks and you, and you start to sleep. Usually that means that healing has taken place. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking a rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead now. Get the picture. This person who they have seen declared himself as Messiah, seen him declared himself as equal with God, they watched him make the lame walk, they watched him make the blind see, they could take the books of Isaiah and the other prophets and like a checklist say, yep, yep, he said he could do it. 